hundred miles out in the North Atlantic. A small open boat runs for her life before a Force 9 gale. A boat from another century. A boat made of leather. On board, five men risk cold, discomfort, and their lives. Their purpose? To pursue a legend. Around the North Atlantic lies a chain of islands that form stepping stones to the New World. And along them, a week before, the leather boat and her crew had set their course. The legend that drew them tells how a 6th century Irish abbot, St Brendan, made a great voyage from Ireland, past many other islands, to a vast land far across the sea. Could he have reached America 900 years before Columbus? To test this theory in a replica of his boat was the object of the Brendan voyage. The early Christian Irish were famous as great seafarers. On this stone pillar is a carving of one of their boats, an open boat which four men row while a fifth holds a steering paddle. Today, the descendant of this ancient craft is still in use as a fishing skiff off Western Ireland. The Carach, its wooden hull covered with tarred canvas. Both Carach and carving point to the shape of St. Brendan's boat, but the legend said it was skinned with hide, weak stuff to face an ocean. Yet testing did hold out some hope. Drummed in brine, flexed and rolled, then torn apart. A leather tanned in oak bark, as in St. Brendan's time, retains its strength where modern rivals fail. At Josiah Croggan's tannery in Cornwall, Ground-up oak bark is still steeped in water to make the tanning liquor where oxhides lie for months on end to produce a leather just as in St. Brendan's day. For their boats, the Irish wrote how they then dressed their leather with grease. But they did omit one detail. Greased oxhides stink. Timber for masts and oars, steering paddle, and the wooden frame of a leather boat in St. Brendan's day would have been cut from hand-picked Irish oak and ash. To build his replica of St. Brendan's boat for the modern voyage, historian and explorer Tim Severin had devoted several years to a close study of the early Irish, their voyages, boats and building materials. And what you want, especially for masts, uh, you want something that'll be very um, subtle. Yeah, whippy. You know, and, uh, whippy. Yeah, yeah, would do well. You know, very, uh, this, this, is, this is what you'll want. Uh, the north side of it, yes. the rings are a little bit narrower closer together here than they are on the south side, the sunny side. So for any of the better quality pieces, yes. we will try and take uh, the motor, the, the, the north side. At a boatyard near Cork, a unique hull took shape. Its slender ribs of ash hooped between oak gunnels like the rib cage of a stranded whale. The loose frame would be lashed together with leather thongs. Here, George Maloney joined the project, Tim's first choice for crew as sailing master. Are we running out of those? 
thicker ones, George. Yeah, thicker ones, man. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Do you find that they're okay. stretching enough when you do that? When you're pulling on them? The job was backbreaking. Day after day, they crouched inside the wooden skeleton, poking and groping for slippery strips of leather, then heaving the knots tight until their muscles ached. Two miles of leather secured the frame with 1,600 knots. Slides up. Now came the most crucial stage of all the outer skin of hide. To stitch it, they used threads of hand-rolled flax, another raw material from St. Brendan's day. To show them how came John O'Connell, harness maker. O'Connell also oversaw the cutting of the 49 ox hides needed, fitting them neatly around the contours of the wooden frame. Next one, I'll straighten that right up to nothing there. Next hide will come over in line with this. Two rows stitching here, two rows here. And that double gives stitching. Us, that gives a double thickness of leather. Double thickness of leather on the back and the bow. A master saddler from Birmingham showed how to drive an awl straight and through to follow through with the needle before the hole closed up then pull the thread taut with a snap. The task was immense. 23 miles of thread were needed and 30,000 stitches, all by hand. I don't want to put too much grease on. Every seam was coated with wool grease to seal the stitch holes. And a four inch skid of oak was put in place to protect the leather skin should the boat ever run aground. Last, on January the 24th, 1976, the replica medieval boat was ready to be launched. Tim's wife, Dorothy, brought their four-year-old daughter, Ida, to christen the boat with whiskey. Irish whiskey for a very Irish occasion. After a blessing by St. Brendan's spiritual descendant, the Bishop of Kerry. Let us pray. Hear, O oh Lord, our prayer and bless with your right hand this boat and all who sail in it. Send your angel from heaven to keep them safe from every danger, and after a tranquil voyage, may they land and be united in joy once again with their loved ones. We ask you this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. What are you going to say? <laughs> On May the 17th, the Brendan voyage began. Wives and families gathered to see her off from Brandon Creek in southwest Ireland, from where St.